Hi class, welcome to InDesign Lab 2. You're going to need two files to start today, Ramen Ingredients Photoshop document and Noodle House Illustrator document. Um, we'll create an all-new InDesign document from scratch using assets from those two files. Um, today we're going to kind of go over again our pages and margins, frames, layers, um, placing images into a document, copying vectors into a document, paragraph styles, embedding links, and effects. All right, when you're ready, let's go ahead and create a new InDesign file. All right, so we're going to come up here in InDesign and we'll start a new file. This document we're going to create is a menu for a ramen noodle house. Um, we will call it Noodle House. And we're going to work in inches as our units. I want you to make sure that the width is 9 inches, the height is 17 inches, that we have four pages, so this is going to have a front cover, an inside spread, and a back cover, that we start on page 1. Um, we will keep our 0.5 inch margins that it probably comes default with, and then we are going to have a bleed of a quarter inch. So we're going to have some of our images go off of the edge of the menu, so they'll bleed off. And then if we were to send this to a printer, they would print it and then cut it so that that image would make it all the way to the end of the paper. All right, when you have all those settings fired up and ready to go, we will create the document. All right. If you have your windows open from last time, pages, layers, and links, etc., your pages will show you your layout of your page one, which is your cover, then your two-page inside spread. So the center line is kind of like where the spine of a book would be, where the center fold of our menu would be, and then the back cover if you were to close it. All right, we are going to prep this file um, before we bring all those assets in from our other two documents. We'll prep this file by creating three layers. We're going to have a background layer, a image layer where we're going to put all of our images and a text layer where we will organize all of our text. All right. Now make sure you have the background layer selected right now because we're actually going to go back to our pages and we're going to create a parent page. Now a parent page is like a master template that is applied to any page in a document where it has been connected. So a parent applied, you see that little a in the corner of all these. Anything that we put on a parent page, so if we double click on our parent page, will occur anywhere in our document that is tied to the parent. We're going to use it just for a background color. We can use the rectangle tool. Zoom out just a little bit and create a rectangle that goes all the way to the edge of our bleed, which is that outer, that outer uh, guideline. And then we are going to change the fill color, fill color of this rectangle to a hex code. So we're going to highlight the six digits here, and we're going to make it 484848. It's like a nice dark, warmish gray. All right, this is going to be the background color of our menu. Now as soon as you put that in the parent, you'll notice that all of the subsequent pages in the document reflected that. Now because we did that in our background layer on the parent, um, it won't appear over the images or text on the other pages. Alright, so to exit our parent page, we can just go ahead and double click on any of the other pages in our document, and then we're back into our document. Um, Let's talk about what we're going to need on this document. So the very front is going to host uh, our logo as well as the name of the restaurant. So the, the picture logo and the text logo. Inside the spread is going to include all of our menu items. So our noodles, our broth, our protein, our toppings, our desserts, etc. And then the back will have another copy of a logo and then some 
contact information for catering. All right. Um, on the text layer, we're going to create three different um, treatments of text. Um, we want our menu to feel very um, cohesive. So every time that there's a menu section, we want to use formatting of text that is a menu section. Every time there's a price, we want to use a different formatting. And every time there's the name of a food, we want to use a different formatting. So we're going to come up here to type and paragraph styles. Excuse me, I meant character styles. But you know what? Now you know where that one is too. I think this is just next door. All right. I want you to create, let's see, make sure I'm in the right layer, the text layer. And on page two and three, just off here to the side, I'm going to create a text box. And in this text box, I'm going to type in menu section. Sorry, it's very small on my screen, very small and out of the way. It's okay, we're going to change it to something bigger. Then I'm going to change my font to one of the Adobe fonts that should be included in your subscription. Um, it's called Simotype Keynote. I'm going to change this menu section font size to 48 points. And then I'm going to change the color by double clicking on my little color swatch here. I'm going to type in a hex code. This code is FAA338. Now the reason we're doing this by a code instead of by sight is that this is going to be one of the colors in our logo. And we want there to be a lot of cohesion in our design. So we want to repeat things like our logos. Our next I will Go ahead and center this inside of its bounding box. So this is our menu section, text. Now in order to create a character style out of this, I'll have to have this object selected. I might squeeze that bounding box in a little smaller, it's pretty big. And then in my character styles, I'm gonna hit, oh, I just lost it. I'm gonna hit the plus sign here. Now what this is gonna do is Anytime I create any text box, I can click on character style one, which I'm actually going to rename, and so are you, to menu section. And then it will automatically fill it with this information, which is the font, the size, and the color. All right, we could make it a paragraph style so it'll also remember our paragraph alignment in the center. All right, but that's one way to create kind of um, a template for type. And we'll, we'll use it a whole lot here soon, so you'll you know, understand its utility. All right, next, let's go ahead and create a second text box. This one is going to be called our food name. The food name needs to be 24 points. It's still going to be the same font, but it's going to be 24 points and it's going to be a different color. The color is going to be um, FCF6AC. Right, so this is another color that's going to occur in our logo, and we want to make sure that it is echoed throughout our design. So there's our food name. We'll go ahead and add that to our character styles using the little plus sign in our window and call this one food name. All right, last character style. This one is called price. And price is 18 points. That's the size. And its color is hex code E C four four two four. That really bright koi fish red. Can't miss it. Can't miss the price. When you're done formatting, we'll add that as another character style, and we will call that one price.
Okay, we are well on our way to creating this menu. Next, we're going to open that Illustrator file, the Noodle House Illustrator file, and we're going to copy vector information into our InDesign document. Again, InDesign is built to host some of these vector shapes and objects. Now it has some limitations that we'll talk about shortly. First, I want you to let's go ahead and take a look at our image logo of the fish and our text logo of text. You'll notice that this text logo is not actually editable text. It is just shapes. It's been outlined into shapes. All of these objects are those three colors we just determined with our character styles. Um, they're also all solid fills. We don't have any fancy gradients um, or stroke treatments to any of them. We're trying to make this as simple as possible for InDesign um, to convert. All right. InDesign doesn't always take uh, different types of strokes or different effects or gradients very well. Um, it also is death on patterns. So if you're going to put a pattern into InDesign, you'll probably want to export a high resolution JPEG or PNG. Now the fish is also a bunch of outlined objects with fills. There aren't objects with stroke in them anymore. Those have been turned into shapes with fills. This is so we don't have any sizing issues or treatment issues. They're also just those couple of very flat colors, no fancy gradients to confuse the program. Let's go ahead and copy Command C and go to InDesign and on our very front page hit Command V. I think we're in the wrong layer. Let's go in the image layer, Command X, Command V. Now, I'm not sure why this frame is this large, so I am going to select all my shapes with my Y arrow key, Y arrow tool here. I'm going to hit Command X and Command F again. Oops, or Command V again. And it seems to have solved some of our bounding box problems. So this is again kind of like a, an indication of some struggles between the two programs, some incompatibility. So that bounding box coming in at such a very strange size. I'm going to go ahead and regroup all those, Command G. And then we'll go back to Illustrator. We'll collect the fish, Command C. If you're on a PC, you'll use Control C. We'll go to InDesign, Command V. Oh, that bounding box didn't have any problems. Good. All right, so these are still both vector. If we were to select any of these objects with hotkey A, we could still move and change and resize and delete anchor points, etc., as if they were built in Illustrator. Um, let's build a guideline. So we're going to use our rulers, which are here on the edge of my application frame, these right here. If you don't have rulers, go ahead and hit Command R. Those reveal them and hide them. And if they're not in inches, go ahead and right click on your rulers and select inches from the drop down menu. And then we know that our menu is nine inches wide. So half of that, we're going to go ahead and drag a ruler from our vertical or guide from our vertical ruler. We're going to go to four and a half inches and put ourselves a little guideline there in our page. So we know where halfway is. And we're going to do it again, half of 17 be eight and a half. So we know where the exact center of the top of our menu is using guidelines dragged from our rulers. So in this case I want to move both of my objects up here into kind of the upper half of my menu front. I'll use my align tool to give a nice uh, center alignment of those two groups. Again, you can make sure that you're aligning to the page when you do that. And then I want the Noodle House text to be large. I want it to go all the way to my margins. I think I also want the fish to be a little bit larger, so I'll hold down Shift while I resize it. And I think I'll put the fish's kind of nose right in the crosshairs of the center. Maybe it's eyes, you know? Yeah, let's make sure that the eyes are going right through the center of the menu right there. This is a nice reason to have guidelines so that you can 
center things visually on a page. All right, we're gonna need a duplicate of this fish and this text. So we're gonna hit Command C. And we're gonna to go to the back of the menu again. This is where we're gonna put a bunch of catering information. Hit Command V. And this time we're gonna make it smaller. It just has to take up just a little bit of space at the top of the back of the menu. We don't want the back of the menu to feel more important than the front. We can use our align tool to make sure it is centered. And then we're gonna need one more copy of just the text, the text noodle house. Now it's not editable text, but it's the text logo. And hit Command C, and then on page two of our inside spread, I'm hit Command V. I'm gonna place this in the upper third area of this menu. We might change it again later, but let's go ahead and place it there for now. All right, next, let's go back to our Illustrator file. Let's talk about this fun halftone pattern. Now this is just a created halftone pattern using um, a series of boxes, or squares in Illustrator that have a black stroke that is a dotted line, a dashed line. Each one is a slightly larger uh, stroke size as it approaches the center, which is how we get that fun kind of half tone look. Now I'm about to show you kind of some incompatibility problems again between Adobe Illustrator and InDesign. If I copy these, Command C, and I paste them into InDesign, I'll go in here, Command V, um, you'll notice that my alignment on the center, on, excuse me, on the corners of these dashed lines um, has kind of started colliding, which is how I get this kind of really strong X in the center. This is because, I'm gonna delete this. In Illustrator, we have a tool in our dashed line that allows us to align the dashes to the corners and path ends. So that's available here in our stroke palette. That is not available in Adobe InDesign. So it's a very small difference, but it does make a visual change. So before we bring this halftone pattern into the background layer of InDesign, we are going to have to outline the stroke, create shapes out of it. So we're gonna go to Object, Path, and Outline Stroke. Now, we no longer have a, a stroke path. We have a bunch of objects with fills. We'll use our Pathfinder Tool Unite to glue all those ones in the center together before we bring this into InDesign. Now InDesign is gonna see a lot coming in, a lot of shapes, and it's probably gonna give us a warning that it needs to compress it. So we'll hit Command C now, enter our InDesign document, go to our background layer, because this is part of our background, and hit Command V. Yep, all right. So it is embedding the data as a different format, a different vector format, just to save us some memory. All right, now this object, Let's go ahead and change. Um, we're gonna change its transparency. We don't want it to appear black. We just want it to be a little bit darker than our background color. So we're gonna use a window called effects. Now in effects, we have our blending mode, our opacity, and then we also have access to effects that are in Photoshop. All right, here we're just gonna change the opacity maybe down to about 50, 50%. So it adds texture into our document. We're gonna use this a couple times. So first I want you to select it, hit R for rotate, and rotate that entire group 45 degrees. Let's bring it to our cover page, and let's have it occur twice on the cover at the top and the bottom. We get some fun textural kind of creeping in from top and bottom. If you want to see how this looks without all the frames, go ahead and hit W. You're going to see that happening. Now, once I do that, I actually realize that I want my uh, logo and fish to come down just a little bit. So I'll select both of those and move them downward. Check it again with W. I like that balance. Now, inside our spread on page two and three, We'll just use a couple of copies of it, just placed around. They'll show up behind a bunch of our images. Um, let's see, 
hold down Option to duplicate an object, just like in Photoshop and Illustrator. The programs are related. All right, so there's one. We'll place another one right here, two. We're not going to place them in like an exact grid because we do want it to feel kind of organic and natural. We'll offset these a couple times. And have another one peeking up here. All right, we will leave this texture off of the back of the menu. We'll just use it in our spread and on the cover. All right, this layer is now finished. We are going to lock it. So go ahead to your layers palette, wherever I set mine. and we'll lock the background layer. All right, so your images for Noodle House and the fish should be in your image layer. So if you hadn't moved those there, go ahead and use uh, Command X to cut them and Command V to paste them back in, and then lock your background layer. All right, next, we're gonna start placing some images inside this document. Let's go ahead and create some frames um, so that we know where they're going to go. All right. Now, if you've taken a peek at those documents already, that's that's fine. Um, we're going to stay in InDesign for just a minute, and we're going to use the tool frame F for frame to build some kind of housing frames where we're going to put images. Um, oops, I'm going to drag one from the top of page two. Sorry, I'm scrolling all over the place. I'm going to drag a frame, so this is hotkey F, from the top of page two all the way down to where it cuts into the Noodle House text just a little bit. Now I could end up changing this later, and that's just fine. All right. So this is going to house a bowl of ramen, a picture of a bowl of ramen. Um, next, I'm going to create a frame for our broth and noodles section. and then a frame for our protein section. Now these frames, they will change in size, but go ahead and just make sure they go from margin to margin on the inside. All right, um, on page three, let's go ahead and build a frame for our toppings. This is gonna be a really large frame, so go ahead and make sure it's nice and tall. And then a frame for dessert. And then we'll go into Photoshop and look at those images and export them as their own assets. All right, so go ahead and open Photoshop. The ramen ingredients Photoshop document. Now this is an example of a lot of work that you would have done prior to opening an InDesign document to prep your image files. So all of these have been cut out onto their own layer Um, using paths and selection tools. Um, they have been adjusted, their color has been adjusted, their brightness has been adjusted, their saturation has been adjusted, so that they all feel related to each other. They all feel nice and bright. Their colors um, are adjacent and their lighting is similar. All right, so you would spend a lot of time in Photoshop prepping your images before bringing them into InDesign. So these three sizes of plates, we have four desserts, we have 12 toppings, four proteins, three broths, three noodles, and that image of the bowl of ramen that I talked about a minute ago. All right, now exporting each layer as a PNG at a time by itself was is a very terrible plan. It's not a good idea, it's gonna take us forever. So we're gonna use a tool in Photoshop to export every layer every layer here that's labeled into its own PNG file. And then we'll place those files into InDesign. I want you to turn off the rectangle, the background rectangle. This was just here so that I knew that any of my assets would appear well on the background color of the menu. All right, once that's off, we're gonna come up here to File, Export, and then Layers to Files. 
Now, depending on the speed of your computer, this is going to go fast or slow, but you're going to want to make sure that you are placing these on a desktop. You can find them really quickly later. And that you are just going to give it a prefix of maybe R for ramen, maybe N for noodle house. Okay, NH, NH noodle house. We're only going to export the visible layers. That's why we turned off that rectangle layer in the background. We want to export PNG-24 layer types, file types. We want to include the transparency. And then we want to trim the layers. So we don't want every one of our PNGs to be the size of this document. We only want it to be the size of the pixels of that layer. All right, when you're done with those settings, go ahead and hit run. It's going to take just a minute for my computer, probably take a couple minutes for yours as well. And you'll watch it find every layer trim that layer and export that PNG. Mine's going to take a little bit of extra time because I am also running a screen capture app. So my computer's having to juggle kind of a bit of activity. That's okay. This lab is quite complicated, but what it should do is prepare you to create your next large form document that includes lots of text and lots of images. Um, hopefully all of the stress that it takes to finish this actually pays out for you. This Photoshop document is very large, both in size and in resolution. Um, the reason for that is because if we wanted to print any of these images or the final uh, product of these images, we would need lots of resolution to avoid any blurry or pixelated um, images. So when we bring these PNGs into InDesign, they're actually going to be larger um, than needed and we will shrink them down. Now that's not a, a problem. The problem would be if they were too small and we had to enlarge them. That's a big no-no. That's a resolution no-no. We're getting close. Almost to the end of our toppings and then we'll do our desserts. And move forward. All right, Photoshop export layers to files was successful. Fantastic. All right, I'm gonna go now into InDesign. I'm gonna take a look at those frames that I created. We're gonna start with the top frame above the Noodle House text. We're gonna come up here to File and Place. And then from your desktop, I want you to place the Ramen Bowl PNG and click inside this frame. Oops, except for I had a frame already selected when I did that. I'm gonna click inside this frame with that PNG loaded into my place. Now it's, again, this is larger than the frame itself, so I'm going to have to click on that center target and then hold down shift as I resize the image inside of it. I'm going to rotate my image 90 degrees, so I've got a little bit of egg on the top here. And then I might move my Noodle House text down just a smidge. There we go. So I have both my image that bleeds off the edge and my text here. Next, I want to place 
file place, the image of the chopsticks. Now I don't have a frame for these, so I'm just going to click over here in this empty space so I don't accidentally place it in a frame. And then I want to resize my image to be a little bit smaller. These are very big chopsticks for that bowl. And then resize my frame, resize and replace my frame so that my chopsticks, they're going to bleed over the edge of my document as well. I want them to rest on the side of the bowl and I want the tip of the chopsticks to come right between the text noodle and house. A nice little tasteful angle, almost like an apostrophe. All right, now if I hit W, you would see kind of how that would crop over the end of the document. That's what I'm looking for in yours. All right, next, let's place our plates into our frames that we've kind of created for them. So we're going to go to File and Place. We're going to place our large plate over here in the topping section. We're going to have to change the size of that JPEG. Never a bad thing to have extra resolution. Option and Shift, change the size of that so it fits in the frame. And so there's our large plate. We need a medium plate and two smalls. So file, place, medium. And we'll click that target so that we change the size of the image inside of the frame. Might need to make our frame larger so that it goes to the ends of the margins there. What I want for these plates is for them to go from margin to margin. So we want to place all the images of our toppings on top of them to kind of uh, organize our file. There we go, medium plate. That means we have some editing to do in the large plate to make sure that it goes from margin to margin. So again, you're going to edit the image size and the frame size. And we'll fit all the text in later. All right, next, let's go ahead and place that small file place and that small plate. Resize that PNG. Now that we learned our lesson, we'll resize it to the margin and then we'll do any adjusting to the frame. Oh, it looks like it's almost the perfect size. Yours is going to be different because we're clicking on two different computers, but yay. Okay. Now instead of doing a file place again for the second small plate, I'm just going to delete that frame and duplicate this version. All right, we now have our four plates. Um, we are now going to place frames in here for the images of our food, our food groups. All right, so F for frame. I want you to create a very small frame because we're going to fit six frames on this medium plate. So we're going to create a small one. Now we want all of the frames to be inside kind of the center of the plate, so not writing up on the beveled edge of them. So we're going to need one. I'm going to duplicate two. Looks like that one might actually be on the center of the page. And three. Adobe InDesign is giving me some really helpful little gaps there. And then I will duplicate all three of those below. So this is going to have six ingredients in the center of the plate. All right, and our, this is going to be our protein section. We're going to actually need four, so I want you to just duplicate one of these objects. 
one of these frames. And we will do one, two, three, four. Now, this one's writing a little bit too high on that edge, so I'm going to move them closer together. Get my arrow keys to nudge them. Better. Let me scooch them a little bit here towards the center. Okay. Four in my protein section. I'm also gonna need four in my dessert, so I'm just gonna actually grab all four of those and duplicate them into dessert. Now when it comes to our topping section, this one has the most, this one has 12. So we're gonna get, we're gonna do a duplicate of the four and duplicate that three times. Maybe we should do three, four times. Yeah, I think we should do three, four times. Actually, I'm going to need to delete these. And spread these out a little bit. One, two, three. Push these a little bit further towards the top here. And again, we're just going to leave a little bit of space for some text in between each one because we're going to label. Oh, maybe that was a bad idea. It's okay. We can fix this. It's easier to adjust it now when they're just frames than when they have a bunch of images in them. That, that takes lots of memory. Go ahead and organize yours visually so you've got all of these fitting in mostly the center of this plate. We're going to allow for some wiggle room on this one. Okay. 12 toppings, 4 desserts, 4 proteins, 3 broths, 3 noodles. Let's go ahead and place those images now. We'll do this one section at a time. So go file, place. And first we will do our broths. Miso, chicken, and pork. Miso in that frame, chicken in that frame, and pork in that frame. Then we'll go ahead and resize the image to fit inside our frame. Maybe click on that target to get that second editing tool. Now notice that we have link icons here. It's because these are linked images. Your computer is just remembering where they came from and previewing them here. They're not baked into our file. We'll place our three noodle types now, our udon, ramen, and soba. And then resize those images as well. You'll get really good at this. Fantastic. All right, in proteins, we will go file, place. And from our desktop, we have pot stickers, tofu, ham, and egg. See, so it's far easier to have these frames prepped and then just change the size of the image than it is to place a bunch of images at their exact size and try to get them to match. Your document. All right, next we'll do our topping section. File place. We have 12 of them, just for everything that has that toppings name on it. 
and place each one into a frame. Now you in the future might want to organize these alphabetically or by color or by type or ingredient. Uh, I'm not worried about that today. Let's go ahead and get them in the document. Oops, I make that one smaller. There we go. All right, last we'll do our four desserts, the four pieces of mochi. File, place. Oops, I better make sure I don't have anything selected first. Otherwise it's gonna place it in that frame. File, place. All right, our four flavors of mochi. And we'll resize those images. Oops. Change the size of my frame there. All right, now these are kind of hugging tight a little bit, so I'm gonna scooch my frames apart a little bit, break my rule about them being on the center of the plate. And I'll use a distribute tool next to my line tools to kind of, oops, we'll change it to the selection and then distribute them a little bit. Okay, that's it for all of our images. The last thing we have to do, well, the last thing we have to do about them is label them. So again, we're going to use those character styles that we created and then label every section of the menu, the price and the type of food that it is. All right, we can actually duplicate these to begin with. So go ahead and give yourself a menu section above your noodles and broth. Actually, this reminds me, this Noodle House logo here, we're going to resize it. It's going to be a lot smaller. Make some room. Much better. Okay. I think I'm going to actually even move. So this is something that's going to happen. I'm going to continually adjust as I'm creating uh, to make room for all the different elements. This is something I'm doing visually because I didn't start with a template that had very specific measurements. You might have very specific measurements for something in the future. But since I don't, I can kind of move things around as I go. All right, so this menu section, we are calling it Choose Your Broth, I'm using ampersand, and Noodles. And then we'll name a price. We'll duplicate our little price section and there we'll type in any combo dollar sign five dollars all right next we're going to move our a copy of our menu section here, and we're going to call this one Pick Your Proteins. I'm going to move that 
down a little bit to center here. Now, this one won't have a price like the broth and noodles does because each protein will probably cost a little bit different. So we'll include the price over each individual protein. Um, next, I might need to move all of these, all of the section down, which means Mochi's got to move down too. I need room for the text of select, oh, you know what, let's copy, choose your broth and noodles in any combo, because we're going to need a price on there too. And then we know that the spacing is the same. We have, some, we have some moving to do about our margins, but that's okay. So we'll call this one, select your toppings, and on there, any we'll type in free on the price. Toppings included with noodles and broth. All right, and then let's go ahead and select this, all of this here. We gotta make sure it fits inside our margin so our text doesn't push that edge. I'm trying to move this ever so subtly upwards. without grabbing the chopsticks. You can see why it's important to have layers and selections and groups. This can get really hairy. Okay, Oof. let's check on this with our hotkey W. Oh, look how much cleaner it looks. This is just a breath of fresh air every now and again. Okay, um, next, let's go ahead and duplicate the price and menu section down here to our dessert area. And let's type in order dessert. Type in now price, which is two pieces of homemade mochi for dollar sign two fifty. We're going to have another section down here that includes some text, so let's be a little cognizant of that space and move these objects up a little bit. As long as you have a little bit of a gap here that we can put some text in, you're golden. Go ahead and duplicate. Um, we're going to use that section because we're going to make a section for drinks. This one doesn't include any images. People are pretty familiar with drinks already. I'm going to make this text box smaller. And we're going to need another section for kids. And here shortly we'll put in our uh, items and their prices. We'll get started on labeling the items and the other sections first. All right, I'm going to create a little frame here above my broth and give it a food name. Text formatting. Oops. Switch my text tool. And give it my food name. Text formatting. I'm going to call this miso. center alignment. Now once I have one created, I'm going to do that same thing. I'm going to duplicate and type in chicken. I'm going to duplicate and type in pork. These are my three 
broth types. And then I will duplicate all three of these labels below the noodles and label the noodles. So we have udon, ramen, putting hotkeys all over the place, and soba, noodles. Now if you need to change things like the spacing, go ahead and do that. And then we'll duplicate that name again. And here on our proteins, again, we're going to need both the name and the price. So we're going to need a second, smaller price. If I clicked on that character styles. So I can label pot stickers too. Looks like it's going to be a little bigger. And then the price of two dollars. Move these down a little. Nope, I'm not. I'm gonna leave more there. I'll go ahead and duplicate that a couple times for each one, and then type in those different names. So this is tofu. Three ounce. And that will be two fifty. Ham. We'll put a two in parentheses, two slices for two dollars. And eggs. Two for one fifty. All right, now the balance of all of this, um, if I were to hit W, it's very top heavy on this plate, having both the text and the images kind of towards the top. So I'm gonna select all of those objects, except for the plate and move them down a little bit. This is more of like a visual balance activity. Same thing now if I'm looking at my three different Noodle types. We can move those closer up into our plate and then move our text closer up in as well to the center. Oops, too far. There we go. Oops. Again, if I had very strict uh, measurements that I was following, I would definitely be following them. But since this is more of an eyeballing activity, I'm going to let you do that too. Okay, now we need to label our different ingredients. So I'm going to go ahead and copy, and this one doesn't need price because these are all included free with that bowl of noodles. So these are wonton strips. Let's hit W again so we can use our So we can use our frames. And then I will duplicate this. For every row of ingredients. And then we'll go ahead and type in what they are. Bamboo shoots. Looks like that one needs to be a little longer. Resize it with our selection tool. Cilantro. Seaweed. Sesame seeds. Garlic. Now my picture of garlic is still running into the ends of my frame. Did I lock that? I must have locked that by accident. I can't seem to pick it up. Where is garlic?
I'll make that quite a bit smaller so it doesn't run into the frame anymore. This is a good time for you to look at that as well. Lime, ginger, bok choy. We'll use the American word for that, fish cake. Green onion and mushroom. Right, let's take a look at that without our frames. I see now that I have some spacing issues with how large some of these are, like the ginger is very large, it's almost touching both bits of text. Sesame seed a little bit as well, and wonton strips. So now is the time for kind of visually deselect that text. I'm going to lock my text layer for a second. I keep accidentally selecting it. I'm still stuck on my text. There we go. I seem to have created a very large text box over all of my objects. Do sesame seeds. I might even turn sesame seeds sideways. Rotate it a little bit. So again, I'm just going through visually now and trying to make things a little bit more balanced because everything was a slightly different shape and a slightly different size. And there's nothing wrong with that. But since you're the artist, you now have the power to make it look better than its original. Check on that with hotkey W. That looks so much better. Well, less collision going on. Now I can look at all of these now and think that I can afford to move all of my objects a little bit further towards the bottom of the plate. So I will select everything but that plate. Oh, except I'd better unlock my text layer. So I can select that text too. And move all those down. much better. I want you to pay attention to stuff like that too. All right, we're gonna have to label our four flavors of mochi. I'm just gonna borrow that. Copy it. We have strawberry. And we'll duplicate that. over each of our flavors. I might need to move them and center them a little bit in a minute. Oop, that's not hot. Mochi. Mochi flavored mochi. Hot pocket flavored hot pocket. Matcha. Chocolate. Vanilla. Sorry, every time I hit my scroll wheel, it takes us off screen. Go ahead and align those with my images. And again, it looks like I can kind of afford to move everything downwards a little bit in the plate. We're very, very close now. We have drinks and kids, and then the text for our catering to include. So under drinks, let's go ahead and create a text box. And we will use the character style. It looks like I accidentally renamed that one. Can't remember if I called it food item or not. Anyways, food item. <laughs> and then here we're gonna type in 
tea, coffee, bottled water, and fountain soda. And we're going to duplicate this to the side here, and we're going to change this formatting to price. And T will list under $2. Coffee, $2. Bottled water will be a dollar, and fountain soda will be a dollar fifty. Not a hundred. Now, the leading between the lines of text here is so much narrower than it is in our format for our items. So we're going to have to go ahead and select all this text here, and we're going to change the leading, which is the amount of space between each line of text, until it matches the spacing of our items. All right, and then I want to center both of these below my drinks text. Let's see if we're still within our margins. Great, we're still within the margins. And then I'm actually going to copy both of these because the formatting is already done over into the kids section. And then we're going to type in the kids items, which are chicken broth, plain rice, plain noodles, and a juice box. The price for chicken broth is $1. Plain rice is $2.50. Plain noodles is $2.50. And the juice box is $1. Oops, don't want to get rid of my decimal point. Um, now because I have a teeny bit of wiggle room here, I'm just going to move that text up, balance it out again. I might need to do some more formatting of some spacing along the way. That's okay. Um, the next thing that's actually become really apparent to me is that we didn't make the transparency of our halftone patterns um, gentle enough because here where it's uh, over just text it's competing very hard so let's go to our layers and then we'll open up our background layer again I want you to select all of those groups of halftone pattern lock images so I click Selecting those. Oh, sorry, it doesn't want me to edit things on two different pages at once. Okay, we'll do the menu cover first. So, again, we're going to go to our effects. I'll we'll change it from 50. Let's go down to 30. And then on our two page spread, we'll grab all of those instances on the two page spread and change those from 50 to 30 as well. Okay, much better. We'll go back to our layers, lock the background, and we will add a text box for the back of our menu. I'm actually just going to copy this one from drinks for just a minute. And I'm going to make it a little bit longer and give it give my text a center alignment. And then here I'm going to type in um, a bunch of kind of made up information about the contact information of the restaurant. I'm going to say that it's at 900 North James Street, that it's open daily from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. We'll double return and then go 
let them know that catering is available. Please call. And then we'll do that fake phone number. Same one for Handy Hamster. 800-555-0123. And just for presentation sake, I'm going to add a space there so it doesn't look so crowded. All right, so let's review. We have our background, we have our images, we have our text. We have them placed. They're still linked files. We're going to change that here in a little bit. Um, I would say right now, do any moving or alignment um, that you might need. Now, I'm going to talk briefly while you're doing that about um, if you had several hundred images in a file instead of you know less than 50, um, InDesign would have to start saving a little bit of its memory and computing space by previewing your images at a lower resolution. So the first time this happens, it's really scary because it looks like your images are very pixelated and blurry. That's not what's actually happening to the image, especially if it's linked. What it is is it's InDesign saving itself some power. All right. Now you can manually do this if you select an image on a layer that isn't locked. <laughs> You can manually do this by going into, I think it is object and display performance. And you can tell InDesign to either give you a fast display, which is literally just a gray box, a typical display, which is at a resolution that the program can handle right now. Right now it can handle it at a fairly large resolution. If we had a hundred images, it would look more blurry. Or you can change it to its highest quality setting. Now this is something that you would want to do um, if you were showing this to an art director or somebody with that kind of influence. You'd want to make sure that they could see everything at full resolution at the moment. Um, if your InDesign document is displaying stuff at that blurry stage, um, don't be alarmed because when you do go to export the file into a PDF or any other kind of document, it will export their full resolution, not their display resolution. Just wanted you to know. All right. Hopefully you've done a little bit of that um, editing, kind of moving some stuff around. Um, we're going to add a drop shadow effect to every one of our images so that they feel a little bit more three-dimensional popping off of the menu design a little bit. So go ahead and lock your text layer and your background layer. And we're going to select all the images in this inside spread. And once they're selected, we are going to go to our, looks like I can get it up here as well, our FX. Um, and we are going to add a drop shadow to every image, um, except for, go ahead and deselect that logo of Noodle House. That one doesn't, no, no, we can give it to that one. No, why not? And then we'll give it to the ones on the top too. But we have to work on one page at a time because that's how InDesign works. All right, FX. Drop shadow. We're going to use a multiply blending mode, but we're going to use only a 35% opacity. We don't want to plow through all of our colors. All right. In this drop shadow, we would like the distance to be a 0.125 distance. An angle of 135 degrees and a 0.125 inch size, so how far that shadow lasts. All right, those are the three um, pieces I want you to edit after you've created the opacity of 35% for a black multiplied shadow. I'll go ahead and hit OK. It'll take it just a second. And now you can see that everything kind of casts a small shadow. I still need to edit this spacing right here. That does not look good to me. Um, maybe what I'll do is on my text layer, move my prices up a little bit closer to my Yep, that's what I'm going to have to do. Sorry guys, I was telling you to edit yours and then I got yammering. We need space. We need to not run into everything anymore. 
Because that happens when you have to fit a lot on one page. Better. Okay. I hope you're as picky as me one day. I might need to move all of these up just a tad. I might need to move that pick your proteins text up just a tad. Okay, let's go ahead and add that uh, drop shadow effect to our front of the menu. Again, use the same settings. And then we'll add it to the logo on the back of the menu as well, just so that we are consistently treating everything with that effect. All right, there's only one more thing that I'm gonna have you do um, for this file. And that is that we're gonna embed all the links of your images. Now you normally wouldn't have to do this to a working file because your images, let's see, we go to the links. Every image that's in this document is a link. That's why they have all those link icons on them. All right, a link means that Adobe InDesign remembers where this is on your machine, on your computer specifically. All right, so it saves itself the memory by keeping it a link and just continually checking that that link still exists and displaying the image from the link. All right, that's fine when you are the only person gonna work on this file. If you were to send a file full of these links to another student, to a teacher, to a client, etc., and they don't have all of these PNGs on their desktop, these will appear blank. All of those frames will appear blank. And there will be an error saying that the link is missing. All right, that's because they don't have those images on their machine. So the way around that, if you have to send a file to somebody who doesn't have those images, is to embed your links. You can do this one at a time by right-clicking on any link and hitting that embed option. Or we can do it all at once. We're going to select every link in this file and right-click and embed link. It will make the file size much larger, but then you don't have to worry about if so-and-so has copies of these files. Once you've embedded the link, go ahead and save your file. Give yourself a huge pat on the back, a huge round of applause for working this hard. This was a huge task, and save your file. I'm so proud of you. I hope to see you again soon.